we yeah. have 2 p.m. We have Friday, which means that it is time to start our Friday forecasting talks from the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. And today we have a follow up webinar from the one that we had two weeks ago with Stefan Colossa. Uh, this time it will be on forecast accuracy and with the interesting title of fanciful aspiration of false advertising. And well, without further ado, actually, Stefan, over to you. Wonderful. OK, thank you very much. Forecast accuracy, false aspiration or uh, fanciful aspiration or false advertising. So I, uh, I apologize for my my feeble attempts at humor and alteration, but uh, this is just it was stronger than me. Friday is actually my day off, so I'm in a slightly relaxed mood on Fridays. All right, I'm going to talk about one of my little hobby horses. So in my day job, I do retail forecasting. We had a long presentation on that two weeks ago. And in my spare time, I pontificate on point forecast accuracy measurement and in more generally forecast accuracy measurement. And I'm uh, here going to discuss a few of the finer points in this little talk here. So we're going to talk about point forecast evaluation, including quantile forecasts, because those are also a kind of a point forecast. I'm going to go into that a little later on. Then also talk about how do we assess significance, statistical significance of forecast accuracy, and finally touch on accuracy benchmarks. And actually, this is only a part of um, a longer talk. I would also like to also discuss stuff like interval forecast evaluation and classification evaluation and density forecast evaluation. But even convinced me to, to keep it short and to the point today. And perhaps there'll be a follow up talk in that second season that Ewan was just talking about. All right, let's talk about point forecast evaluation. So let's discuss point forecasts. What are point forecasts? Well, uh, the idea is that we have a time series and we have a couple of actuals that we would like to forecast and that we have a single point forecast for each of these actuals. So tomorrow's temperature is going to be 37 degrees Celsius. Well, that's probably a little hot for this time of year, but something like that. It's not an interval. It's not a density. It's just a point. It's just a single number that we hope is a good forecast. So how do we assess forecast? A point forecast like these. So there is a, a, a bewildering variety of point forecast error measures, and I'm going to use the the acronym FEMS for now on because it's uh, simply less of a mouthful. Uh, there's tons of these, and every uh, forecasting textbook will explain some of them and gloss over some others. So there's uh, things like the mean squared error MSE, which is, well, just as it says on, on the tin, it's the mean of the squared errors. We just take the errors, so the differences between the forecast, the point forecast, and the actuals, take the squares, and take the mean over these. And that, of course, is in uh, in terms of units, this is uh, squared degrees Celsius or a squared tins of soup or whatever. So we might be tempted to use the root mean squared error, take the root of the mean squared error, and then we're back on the scale of the original time series. There is also something like the mean absolute error. So just take the errors and take absolute values and take the mean over time. We can also have the mean absolute scaled error, which is just the mean absolute error and scaled by a number S, which uh, the def definition of which varies in the uh, original framework or the original proposition. It's the in sample random walk one step ahead forecast and of that we take the mean absolute error. So the idea is take the mean absolute error and to make it comparable between time series, we scale each time series mean absolute error by something that puts all these on a common scale. So it's a scaled kind of a mean absolute error. The mean absolute percentage error, which just takes the absolute error as a percentage of the actual and then takes the average over those. That is extremely common, especially in a supply chain forecasting context. A little variation on that is the weighted mean absolute percentage error that just takes the absolute error, the sum of the absolute errors is divided by divides by the actuals, and this actually can be interpreted as a weighted mean of the absolute percentage errors, and uh, it's a simple derivation. So we can scale all of these because uh, prima facie they are not really comparable, especially the mean scale, squared error and the mean absolute error, they're not comparable between time series that are on different 
orders of magnitude. So if we have one time series that's around 10, and another one that's around 100, then we can't directly compare the mean scale, uh, squared or mean absolute error. So we can scale them as in the mean absolute scaled error or in other ways. So we can also take the root mean squared error and scale that one. So it mainly turns into big long acronyms. And then we have the error for a single time series. We can aggregate these over time series, for instance, using weights. So we may want to weight the error of a more important time series, whatever that means. We may want to weight that more heavily and we can aggregate. One little thing that I have found very useful is the, to always look at the bad guys. Essentially, if you have a, a big corpus of time series, like a thousand time series, we have our forecasts, we have our errors. I always look at the 10 worst forecasts because you learn quite a lot about that. You either learn something about why your forecast is broken or you learn something about, oh, I didn't know that happened in my data set. It's always very, very enlightening and educational. All right, people will often report multiple fans. Uh, compare a link at the bottom. There's a little uh, thread at cross validated about uh, reporting mean absolute error or mean squared error or whatever. Or also in the literature, you'll usually see many different fans. Let's talk about the MAPE. As I said, that is a very common one in uh, supply chain forecasting. Well, first of all, if uh, any one of these YTs is zero, uh, the entire thing becomes undefined and that's an unhappy place to be. Um, in such a case, some software uh, is rumored to, in such cases, simply disregard the error in for the time series, uh, for the time period where YT is zero. That is not good practice because that account, that amounts to saying we don't care what the forecast is if the actual is zero. But typically we care very much whether we're forecasting 10 or 100, whatever, jumbo jets or something, if we are selling zero. So that's not good practice. Better thing is possible to use the weighted MAPE, which can deal with a couple of zeros. But yeah, let's talk later on about what's uh, what's happening there. Only makes sense for really strictly positive data, not really temperatures, because that can go negative and positive and doesn't really make a lot of sense to talk about percentages here. Could also start waxing philosophical about interval scales and ordinal and other scales. It's not differentiable as such if you're trying to minimize it. If you want to use this as an objective function, but it can be approximated smoothly to any desired degree of goodness of fit. Uh, it is so common and so popular because it's interpretable. And I put that in scare quotes for a reason. There's actually a couple of things here. One thing is that the, the MAPE can easily be above 100% and people usually get a little uh, antsy if their percentage error is higher than 100% and with good reason because if your error is above 100% then a better forecast will be a flat zero because then all these y hats up here are zero and then you also only add up ones and then your mean absolute percentage error is 100% and if the original one was above 100% then a flat zero is a better one, a lower MAPE. Also, some people work with accuracy and define that as 100% minus MAPE. And if uh, the MAPE is above 100%, then their accuracy becomes negative. And yeah, people get very, very nervous about negative accuracy. Nobody wants that. That's the one uh, pitfall with uh, the interpretability of the MAPE. And the other one is that uh, this is a bit of a red herring. And the MAPE can lead to strongly biased forecasts. I'm going to go to, to that into my next slides. Uh, I have a little thread on cross validated about the shortcomings of the mean absolute percentage error where I collected lots more information about that. All right, so but what does that really mean about these biased forecasts? Here's a little quote. I'm quoting myself, sorry for that. So it's, I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it. The best point forecast depends on the error or accuracy measure. What does that mean? Here's a little time series. It's simulated data, so we actually know what's happening here. And uh, the question really is, what's the best point forecast? These are independent and identically distributed IID data. It's just I uh, generated 100 different random numbers based on some distribution and just put them one after the other. There is no order in here. And since there is no temporal dynamics, the best point forecast for the foreseeable future is a flat line because there is no dynamics in here. They're all IID. 
So it must be a flat line. The question is, where do we need to put the flat line? Uh, unfortunately, this is not interactive, so I can't just uh, go ahead and ask you people. So we may need uh, a poll next time we do something like this here. Here's a density that I took this, uh, generated this data from. That may help. It's a gamma density with shape three and scale three, and I just put it on the side, right? So this is you typically see your density horizontally. Here it's vertically, so we it conforms to the uh, to our the vertical axis where our time series is plotted. A couple of options. What's the best point forecast? Here's one option. That's the expectation. The expectation of this gamma distribution here is nine. That's just three divided multiplied by three. It's nine. That's the expectation. A second option for potentially the best point forecast would be the median of this gamma distribution. It's also a measure of central tendency of our uh, of our distribution here. There's no closed form. We can approximate it. It's about eight. Or finally, here's another one. We call that the minus one median, a very uncommon term, uh, but uh, it's actually well motivated. And uh, that is roughly five. This is down here, so far below the other two. So which one is the best point forecast? Actually, um, possibly surprisingly, it depends on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to minimize. If you want to have a low mean squared error, then you want to forecast the expectation. If you want to have a minimal mean absolute error or weighted MAPE, then you want the dotted line, the median. If you want to minimize the MAPE, which is well defined here because the gamma is always above zero, so we are not dividing by zero. If you want to minimize the MAPE, then you want to have this guy down here, about five, the minus one median. Now that means that the best point forecast depends on the error or accuracy measure, depending on what you're trying to minimize. Now, a couple of interesting consequences of this. So typically your, your forecasting methods, will be it exponential smoothing or, or REMA or deep learning or LSTMs or whatever, most of these aim for an unbiased forecast. So for a point forecast that gives you the expectation of the future density, that is an MSE minimizer. So if your if your forecasting method does what it usually wants to do, then it's going to give you this dashed line up here and it's going to be happy. And you're actually going to have a minimal MSE forecast. But of course, if your bonus depends on the MAPE, uh, then uh, this is probably bad because you're over forecasting and you're not getting the MAPE optimal forecast. So if you want to minimize the MAPE, then you want this guy down here and not necessarily point forecast that your software is giving you. Other consequence, an interesting consequence is can we fork? Well, so the question really is, can we really meaningfully evaluate this point forecast that aims at minimizing the MSE? Can we evaluate that with the MAP? Well, not really, because we're aiming at two different things. This forecast up here is aiming at minimizing the MSE, not minimizing the, the MAP. Right, so it's it's like uh, taking a taxi cab and asking the cabbie to take the scenic route and at the end of the trip complaining because it took so long. Well, yeah, but you asked him to take the scenic route and take a detour and show you the nicest, uh, the nicest views, right? It's two different things. We're aiming at two different things here. So the dirty little secret, I, I'll just call it that way, uh, if your forecasting software is aiming for an unbiased expectation forecast, so this guy up here, but your bonus depends on getting a low MAPE, then you just want to take this forecast here and reduce it by a couple of percentage points or in some other way, and you will increase your reduce the MAPE and get a better bonus. Also, I, I like to say you may want to educate your manager why tying a bonus to the MAPE may or may not be a good idea. It may actually be a good idea. It depends on what you're actually trying to get at. So typically I'd like to do a little test here. So here's a another generated randomly simulated time series. It's again IID data, they're intermittent. So tons of zeros in here. Actually, that's a Poisson distribution, and most just observations are actually zero. More than half is zero, and the rest is one, or there's a, there's a two up here. So what do we want to forecast to minimize the expected mean absolute error? Well, if most observations are zero, then the median is zero. 
the median of this distribution is zero. Half or more of the observations are zero. That's the definition of the median being zero. And the expected I mean absolute error is minimized by the median of the distribution. So you want to forecast a flat zero down here. And the same actually holds for the weighted MAPE and the mean absolute scaled error. If you want to minimize these error measures for this time series, you want to forecast a flat zero. And there are some uh, interesting uh, papers from a couple of years ago when people were doing intermittent demand forecasting and they were essentially trying themselves into pretzels because they were evaluating their pet new method using the mean absolute error and the MAE kept on being minimized by a flat zero forecast and they had to argue in some contrived way to explain why nevertheless their approach would be superior to just forecasting flat zero and the problem just is that they probably were aiming at an unbiased expectation forecast but the MAE was simply not the right tool to elicit that. The MAE is the right tool to elicit the median, which is not the expectation. And the difference can be stark, especially in cases like this here. All right, let's talk about quanta forecast PHEMS. As I said, PHEMS stands for point forecast accuracy uh, error measures. So why, what do quanta forecasts have to do with point forecasts? Well, they're similar to what we just looked at, a quanta forecast. Uh, is always tied to a certain level alpha. That is, again, a single number for each future time period, uh, depends on alpha, such that our probability that the actual outcome is less than this quantile is exactly alpha. Um, uh, these are extremely important for a safety stock calculation or capacity planning. If you're, for instance, if you're a supermarket and you forecast sales, then you need a high quantile forecast because you need safety stock. You don't just want to meet the expected demand because then very often people will come in and not have and not get what they're looking for because you had enough on hand for expected demand but actual demand came out a little higher so you need a safety amount and the safety amount exactly comes from a quantile forecast so you need that so here's the time series that we just met uh, we're seeing it again and uh, three different quantile forecasts as i said these are generated data, simulated data. I know which distribution they come from, so we know what the quantiles are. We can calculate that. That's an 80% quantile, so 80% of actual outcomes are below this red dashed line. There is a 90% quantile up here, so 90% of outcomes are below this green dotted line and the blue dash dotted line up here, that's a 95% quantile. And as I see, of course, there's quite a difference between these here. If you scale this up to a couple of thousand times series, that can make quite a difference in terms of handling costs, in terms of spoilage, in terms of, of, uh, of working capital and so on and so forth. So getting the correct alpha number here is a bit of an art in itself. OK, so now assume we have one of these um, quantile forecasts. And the question is, is that actually a good quantile forecast for the pre-specified alpha level? So if we wanted to have an alpha of 90%, and we're actually aiming at this green number here, but perhaps we don't know that if we're not sim using simulated data, but using actual observations. And perhaps our, our software gives us the red line here. How do we know that we're actually too low? How do we know that our quantile forecast doesn't give us a 90% level, but only an 80% level? Well, there is a quantile loss, and you can look at Ganiting, for instance, but exa it's exactly the same kind of loss as is used in quantile regression, which is a regression approach that aims not for the expectation as standard ordinary least squares, but that aims at a conditional quantile. So essentially the same thing here. They're using this kind of quantile loss here. It's again not uh, you know, differentiable, but it works out well enough. And you can actually use that to assess whether a a point forecast gives you a good quantile forecast. As a little illustration, now you have to kind of flip your head or bend your head sideways because what am I doing here? Um, I'm looking at the time series up here and I'm plotting potential point forecasts on the horizontal axis. So here in the time series, we had the outcomes on the vertical axis and now I'm plotting the potential uh, point forecast on the horizontal axis and for each alpha level, I give the expected loss function. And we see that, for instance, the red dashed line, that's the loss for the 
uh, level that we're aiming for, and we see how that has a minimum exactly at about 13, which is exactly the number that we have here is an 80% quantile. So this is serves to illustrate that the that quantile forecast is actually minimized uh, with respect to this loss at the correct quantile. And one other thing to keep in mind here is that these minima here, if we're kind of using the loss function here, which is the correct loss function, if we're using that to get the correct quantile forecast, and we have to deal with the fact that the minimum is extremely flat. So here it's very hard to, dis to notice that we should be forecasting 19 for a 95% quantile forecast and not 20 or 18 because it's uh, the loss is just so very flat around the minimum here. So it's kind of hard, but it's doable. So a couple of takeaways from our FEMS. So we should, since each FEM will tend to elicit its own kind of point, point forecast, it makes sense to tailor your FEM to the business problem. If you want an unbiased expectation forecast, you need the mean squared error, or perhaps the root mean squared error or a scaled version. If you want a safety stock, you need a quantile loss. If you want the median, you can use the mean absolute error. And the MAPE, honestly, I've rarely found a business problem that really requires a MAPE optimal forecast, to be honest. It's always good to know which FEM your software tries to minimize, so you know whether it's shooting in the wrong direction, whether your software is taking you to the scenic route, although you're trying to get there by the quickest route. You want to point, tailor your point forecast to the FEM that you want to minimize or that your bonus is tied to. It doesn't really make sense to evaluate the same point forecast using different FEMs. It's kind of like taking somebody's body temperature and saying, well, uh, you have body temperature of 38 degrees. That's a very high blood pressure. It is, it is not a blood pressure. It's two different things. Ideally, forecast full predictive densities, and then we can always extract the optimal point forecasts, and that's the thing that even convinced me to drop for the point for the time being. And also try to gently educate users and clients about the potential pitfalls in here. So that's actually part of what I'm doing here. All right, so that was the first part, and actually the, the second and third part will be much shorter than the first one, so bear with us. Significance checking. So if we have multiple forecasts for a time series, or for tons of time series, then uh, one of the forecasting methods will be better. It's because there's always a winner to every race, and the question really is, is the difference due to chance, or is it actually statistically significant? If we're comparing two forecasts, then we can have some kind of point forecasts, but actually it also works out for interval and density forecasts with some kinds of errors or scores. And uh, what we can simply do is we can simply take a Z transformation essentially of that. We take the difference between the scores and uh, take the average and standardize by, the, um, by an estimate of the variance of the difference, right? Um, and under some quite weak conditions, uh, we can say that this uh, thing here is 0, 1 normally distributed, the standard normal distribution, and we can uh, simply assess this using our form favorite normality test, which is, for instance, Shapiro Wilk. So you can, and that's, yeah, that's the Diebold Mariano test. It's, uh, there's actually a nice paper by Diebold from 2015, which uh, discusses how Diebold and Mariano came up with the test and how they, it was not exactly easy to get this published uh, because people didn't really see the point. Uh, nowadays, people do see the point. So the original publication was from 1995. So people nowadays see the point. The problem is that this only helps us compare two forecasts but typically we have multiple forecasts. We have typically multiple forecasting methods like uh, different flavors of exponential smoothing, ARIMA, deep learning, LSTMs, and so on, and typically multiple time series and multiple evaluation time periods, so um, at least a three-dimensional cube here. There is a number of more recent tests. They're all rank-based and they can be used for any point forecast error measures. They essentially say, is there one forecasting method that dominates all the others in terms of the ranking for each time point and time series? And that works whether you're looking at the MAPE or at a quantile loss or anything else. And the first one is the multiple comparisons with the best test, which was uh, proposed by Koning et al. 
uh, originally in the context of the M3 competition. So they reanalyzed the M3 submissions and figure out which ones actually significantly differed from the others. And the same paper, uh, there is also a comparison against the mean of the of all uh, proposed forecasts. And uh, then there is also the friedman nemanyi test by Demichar in 2006, which was originally not proposed in the context of time series, but has been used recently uh, for time series. And you get plots like these and where you can actually find, for instance, we have four methods here. We have the mean ranks and uh, one method, method A, for instance, has a mean rank of 1.8. So often it's first rank and sometimes it's second rank. And then we get a, a little, essentially a confidence uh, bar here. And then we have the other methods and we can see whether their confidence bars overlap the one from, for instance, method A. And for all of these, we see that the uh, these little error bars overlap with the one from method A. So they're not statistically significantly different. And if you have a ton of potential time series, then uh, yeah, this gets these plots get bigger and more enlightening essentially. And actually, tests like these have been used in the recent M4 and M5 competition to actually see which of the many many submissions are um, are more useful. Uh, this uh, there has been an empirical comparison of these tests by Michel Ibon and, and others. There was a presentation at the 2012 International Symposium on Forecasting. And they're also implemented in a time series tools package for R, which I believe is not yet on CRAN, but at least downloadable from GitHub. And of course, all of these, whether Debug Mariano or um, uh, or the Nemenyi and MCB and so on, they all assess statistical significance, which is nice, especially for statisticians, not necessarily business relevance. So. Business relevance is also a fun thing. It kind of pays my bills. So let's talk about business relevance. Accuracy benchmarks, actually. What do I mean by accuracy benchmarks? Often, uh, well, I do forecasting for a living. I go out, I talk to customers, and they have us forecast their time series. And um, often enough, people will come to me or likely enough to any other forecaster and say, we know that the industry average is 30%, so you need to achieve at least 25% because that's what we expect of you. Or this project needs to reach a MAPE of 20%, otherwise we'll cut off funding. Or can you guarantee that your software will yield a 15% MAPE? It's very often in terms of MAPE. And there is uh, essentially two possible reactions. Uh, we can smile and agree and get the deal and hope that nobody remembers that at the end, or tell the customer that it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And that is often a hard conversation to have. And yeah, it's what I'm going to discuss here. A couple of examples. This is, I agree, is an ancient paper. It's from 2006, but honestly, the argument hasn't changed. Um, McCarthy et al. They gave, uh, they went to forecasting conferences and just passed out questionnaires. What's your, uh, your, what do you think should be? What's your forecast on the industry level? Uh, what's your percent? What's your MAPE for your forecast on industry level, on corporate level, on product line skew, skew allocation level? What's your, what's your MAPE? What's the MAPE that you get? They collected all these time series, uh, they, all these answers, and said, okay. Based on these questionnaires, we say that on industry uh, at less than three months out forecast horizon, the most recent data we got, which was in a conference in 2006, was 15%. So that's the benchmark. The question is, can we use this column or any other one as a meaningful benchmark? Well, a couple of problems here. First of all, there is this little n equal to one. I find it already very good that they were honest and reported these tiny and so there was just one guy reporting the industry forecast accuracy that they had five for corporate product line and so on very few respondents if you look at this over time the number of respondents really goes down from 50 to 36 to 3 or even from 61 10 years later only one guy answered 10 years later only one guy answered it may have been the same people answering here but if so their forecasts got worse but we don't know whether that really makes a lot of difference um, other things here, do we all have the same idea of what we mean here? Uh, what's well industry? Industry has a wide definition. Um, what is a location that we're talking about? Could be a retail stores, could be a distribution center, could be an entire geography, right? 
or other channels that we have here. Same problem with product lines. So what is a product line for uh, for one producer could be a category or even all of corporate for another one. So these accuracy benchmarks, these published accuracy benchmarks, and they still keep on being published. And honestly, I'm, I'm not going to update my presentation each time a new of these new one of these benchmarks comes out. They don't really make a lot of sense. So you shouldn't put your trust in these published benchmarks because they are not comparable, even within retail. I often talk to people and explain this to, to them and they say, well, OK, let's focus on retail, fast moving consumer goods in retail. And I still say, well, it depends on whether you're really looking at the fast moving products or the slow moving products. If you use an everyday low price strategy, much easier to forecast. Or if you're using promotions, if you're strongly driven by promotion, much harder forecasts. We can't say what a good forecast accuracy is. It's always better to use internal benchmarks, like which forecasting methods are you using right now? What's their accuracy in terms of whatever forecast accuracy or error measure you're, you're using? Or also look at uh, very simple benchmarks like the overall mean. So first of all, once you're uh, before you're, you're investing a lot of time in a wonderful new forecasting method, look whether how much it improves on the simple historical mean as the simplest benchmark that you could possibly do. And it's surprisingly often hard to beat this very simple mean. There is another one of these uh, cross validated uh, threads here where somebody was quite surprised that a simple historical mean outperformed ARIMA. And there was a chorus of people agreeing, yes, that's unfortunate and that's a very common occurrence. The mean is a strong contender. And so you should always compare your uh, proposed new forecasting algorithm to the simple mean. And best, of course, is always look for best practices in forecasting. So for instance, attend the Friday forecasting talks of the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting, even if they don't have me on their little uh, picture slide. It's still, you get lots of best practices here or at industry events or by reading books or actually getting in here. It's, 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 it takes a little longer than uh, asking a consultant for benchmark uh, MAPE numbers, but it's in the end, it's more meaningful. And if your practices and processes are already optimal, then don't worry if your competitor down the road has or says they have uh, better MAPEs because it may simply be that they have easier time series or a more uh, more uh, responsive supply chain that makes for less shocks and out of stocks. And then the question really isn't one of getting better forecasts, but of improving your supply chain. All right, so that was uh, today's talk on forecast accuracy, fanciful aspiration or false advertising. Thank you very much. And Ivan, back to you. Thank you, Stefan. That, that was great, as usual. Sure? Very well Very done. Well done. Uh, I actually asked Robert Files to provide some comments on the talk. Uh, so, Robert, maybe you can come and say what you have to say. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Stefan. It was uh, an all embracing and uh, machine gun like talk and uh, very, uh, very interesting. Um, I'm just going to take uh, two elements of it, um, or at least related to it. Um, if I didn't misunderstand you, you were uh, making an argument at some stage against using um, non-matching criteria between the point forecast and the and the um, uh, the evaluation criteria. Um, and yet I am amongst others have argued exactly to the contrary uh, and the point relates to the, the general issue of the criteria for evaluating uh, a measure of accuracy or uh, the uh, an appropriate uh, accuracy uh, criterion uh, because i mean armstrong for example proposed four criteria i was in the process of uh, looking them up when you uh, finished the talk so you're only going to get two of them at this point but uh, a key one which uh, you, in a sense, through your simulations, assume away is one of robustness. Um, 
and the second of interpretability. Now, uh, you did emphasize interpretability in some sense in the context of the uh, the problem. And I wouldn't in any sense disagree with that. But of course, for many forecasters, perhaps most forecasters, the con context is elusive. They've got the job of producing, in quotes, accurate forecasts. And in, in fact, we did a survey, Paul Goodwin and I, a few years ago, well, quite a few years ago now, uh, where um, accuracy as measured by MAP was the way demand forecasters uh, were evaluated by some considerable margin. Things like uh, root mean square error and so on were, were actually not part of the uh, discussion at all. So uh, what's the, uh, how can you deal with this? Well, I think essentially you have to have for yourself uh, more than one criteria that you're going to uh, examine. I mean, for example, we need to add bias into this whole um, uh, argument as well. So, and uh, linking back to the robustness issue, many of the measures that you've discussed are not inevitably uh, robust, nor are they particularly interpretable. For example, I doubt Rob Heinemann would agree, but I think MACE, for example, is fundamentally uninterpretable. So the interpretability, uh, the um, robustness of the measure and the need to appeal to a variety of audiences with different problem contexts. And one final word you didn't uh, mention, uh, well you did in a way, but relative error measures and the importance of that. One particular problem is with uh, an error distribution which is uh, severely non-normal, there may be relatively few observations gathered from it. To use a relative error measure, uh, as Davidenko uh, pointed out, gives a degree of robustness to the measures and answers a very key question. Which of two me measures or two, two, I'm sorry, two methods or two procedures actually delivers better accuracy? So, um, a variety of criteria, I think, is the, the heart of my argument to deal with the issues of interpretability, different audiences and robustness. Thanks, Robert. Stefan, do you have anything to respond? Uh, well, of course, um, of course I have. Uh, just let's let's try <laughs> not to monopolize this this year. <laughs> OK, so um, yeah, um, you will not be surprised, Robert, that I disagree with the with um, with Armstrong's uh, proposals. First of all, um, interpretability and MAPE. Yes, I agree. Many people are assessed using the MAPE. OK, that's wonderful. And uh, the and what I would propose is beautiful. Tailor your forecasts to whatever your bonus is tied to and just be be aware that your ARIMA is not going to forecast the MAPE optimal point forecast. It's you take the number that comes out of your SAS or R or whatever tool you're using and adjust it to account for the fact that you're not being paid to give an unbiased forecast. You're being paid to give a biased forecast which minimizes the MAPE. So just you could say uh, manipulate it, you could say fiddle with it, and I would say account for the fact that you're being evaluated not on the mean square error. So yeah, people are using the MAPE, and I would say it's it doesn't make sense because what do we use the forecast for? The forecast is not uh, something to be created and put on a pedestal and admired. It's it's an input for subsequent business processes. And most of these processes are either of uh, of the type we want an expectation forecast and an unbiased one. I always come back to retail because I know that best. If you're deciding which promotion to run, then you want to know which promotion has the highest expected margin or sales or something. You're looking for an expectation forecast. Once you've decided on your forecast and your promotion, um, you want to have enough product on hand. You need a safety stock, then you need a quantile forecast. As I said, I've never seen a business process that would need or that would profit from getting this number down here as an input as a point forecast. Never seen that. And that for me says that this accuracy measure 
it's common, yes, but I don't think it makes sense. And robustness, well, that kind of ties into the question of uh, which, uh, which functional of the future distribution do we want to elicit? If we want to elicit the mean, then yes, the mean is sensitive to high values. And if your distribution is one that has a certain propensity to high values, then that is simply the fact. And we shouldn't be trying to hide that by using a, a fork and accuracy measure that kind of drops these numbers. Then we should perhaps deal with it in a way that says, OK, then we don't want the expectation. We just want the median. Well, we shouldn't be using we shouldn't. I think robustness is a bit of a fig leaf here, really. It's a question of what do we use the forecast for and what it's the cost function of a misforecast, and I think that's a better way of dealing with it. And interpretability, yeah, the first time you meet a, a practical forecaster who has a MAPE above 100%, interpretability of the MAPE goes out the window. I but I, I, I agree that there I is the different strands of or I we're arguing for this. MAPE. OK, uh, thanks. Yeah, Robert added that uh, neither he nor Armstrong are arguing for me as a final uh, yeah. comment. So we have several questions um, and actually some of them uh, well, sort of similar. So the first is uh, how do you go from a business target such as I want to minimize success inventory to choosing uh, your error measure? Ah, that's a beautiful question and that's uh, actually the one that we are in retail forecasting that's exactly what you're trying to do especially in perishables where excess in, in durable goods or in consumer packaged goods uh, excess inventory is just clogging your shelves a couple of years ago that was painful because uh, working capital actually cost you something but nowadays with current interest rates it doesn't really cost you anything it's more painful for perishables where excess inventory has to be thrown out after one or two days so think of the strawberries all right so um, yeah, the first thing uh, to figure out is really the cost structure. How costly is excess inventory? How, on the other hand, how costly is unmet demand? And that's actually a, um, a slightly a rather intricate question because if you have excess inventory, then yes, you, part of the costs are you bought stuff that you have to throw away. That you may still be able to get something uh, back in terms of markdowns or uh, in terms of goodwill by donating it. And on the other hand, if you're uh, if you have too little inventory, then yes, you're not meeting demand, but you don't even know the demand. Perhaps in retail, for instance, you don't know how much people would have bought if enough product had been there. So you have to make a judgment call of how much your how high your costs would be. Uh, for uh, or how high your demand would be and how you how your costs are of not meeting that demand and then you also had have, have to add something to the mix about the customers fee for lethal behavior do they always take the freshest apples or do they take apples at ran because that tells you something about how your your stock your uh, will will go down whether whether you'll be always left with the oldest apple at the end of the day. That makes a difference in terms of how much you have to throw away at the end. And then from all of that, you can, in theory, derive an optimal service level. You can say, I want a 90% or an 80% service level, and which number that is really has to depend on your cost considerations and also perhaps on strategic considerations that transcend costs. If you're a retailer, if you're a supermarket and you don't have enough apples at the entrance of your store, then at some point in time you will not get any customers for the rest of the store anymore because people know I will not get apples in there, so I'll just go somewhere else and take all my business elsewhere. So it may be more useful to have a higher service level than would be dictated by pure cost considerations. But I think that the costs and uh, the consequences of your decisions should be the starting point for the entire discussion. Mm -hmm. So in case of inventory, for example, in retail, this would imply that we need to look at quantiles, specific quantiles and ditch uh, MSE, MA and so on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, thanks. Uh, the next question is uh, by John Boylan. The MSE is well known to be sensitive to outliers. Uh, is that there are various ways of making MSC less sensitive, and do you have any recommendations on this? 
Uh, well, uh, that uh, harkens back to that little discussion we we had at the beginning with Robert about the robustness of the MSE, and I would say it's not the MSE that is that is sensitive to outliers. It's the mean that or that is uh, of a distribution that may have fat tails or a propensity to outliers. And then the question really is, um, do we want an expectation forecast? If so, then and we'll have to assess it by the observations that we see. If we want a mean, then we should still be using the MSE and be aware that our error measure may be dominated by not very rare large events. I think the first question really isn't to kind of, it's essentially, it's it's a question of um, I, I'm speeding down the highway and the police are catching me and I tell them I just sped this one time and the police tell me yeah okay this one time but you still were too fast and the, the question can't be to to fiddle with my speedometer so it doesn't show that I'm going too fast just once every week or once every month the question should be uh, how do I deal with my business processes so they don't uh, that the impact of a of a high spike in demand isn't so strong. So it may be the fact that we need to really look at uh, have our decisions based on the median. Honestly, I'm I'm arguing for uh, not looking at forecasting and accuracy evaluation in a vacuum. I'm arguing for seeing it in the context of the wider business decisions that we're making. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, making the MSE more robust is, 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 is to me, is, is similar to taking a thermometer and just cutting off everything above 38% so you don't run a fever and you can go to the party that you wanted to go to. <laughs> Thanks, so that's an interesting analogy. A uh, brief question related to this. Uh, not, shouldn't be very difficult. In case of multiple time series optimized for MSE, what would be the suitable metric different scales you know yeah well i um first of all i would take the root mean squared error so we're back on the scale of the original time series and we're still minimized by the expectation and then when we're summarizing these uh, there's various ways of summarizing them you can take the mean over uh, all of these root mean squared errors if you first scale them for instance by the level by the by the overall mean of each time series so you take it one time series have its forecasts calculate root mean squared error and divide that by the overall mean of the time series and you have kind of uh, root mean squared error as a fraction of the overall mean of the time series and that's something you can more or less compare um, alternatively, you can also look at uh, the cost impacts of forecasts. So we talked about forecast value added. I'd like to think about, we didn't talk about that, sorry, we should have talked about it if we had enough time. So forecast value added, how painful are the forecast error? Can you put a number in some way on our root mean squared errors? And then you can add up the actual numbers and, and numbers with, with currencies on them have a wonderful way of focusing the mind so that's very very interpretable if you can do that and uh, apart from that you can also look at uh, the forecast and the the errors uh, kind of stratified by abc products and most of all look at the most important product and then the less important product separately um, there's different ways you can do that mm -hmm. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I'm moving a bit randomly through questions and uh, I will rephrase some of them so that they uh, align better with what we're talking about. Uh, so people, so when you're, you're asking the questions that people actually wanted to ask and didn't manage to express, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> no comments. The people we need to convince about the topics you talked to us today are actually graduates of business programs, typically MBA and so on. And uh, not all of them, if any, have forecasting education. So there is a question, can the forecasting community take steps to alleviate this uh, and uh, increase awareness? And uh, a question from me is actually, you know, as a consultant, what can you do when the person just doesn't know these topics yeah oh well uh, two different questions the first of all first is uh, the, uh, the forecasting community well I, I like to think that I'm part of the forecasting community and I'm doing my my little part right here and right now and you all are also part of the forecasting community and you all are 
uh, doing your parts by sitting here, sitting through this talk and actually listening to what I'm saying. So um, perhaps you'll be a little better prepared next time this discussion comes up uh, based on, on these examples here. And it's, it's always the case. If uh, this is an unpopular topic, it's theoretical, it's abstract, it, there seems to be a simple answer, maybe, which I'm arguing is not a good answer. And that's always an uphill battle. So I think uh, the first thing uh, that I'm doing is I'm, I'm keep I'm repeating this stuff over and over again. I'm sure some people have gotten heartily sick and tired of my talking about the same things over and over again, but some things will only change through repetition. One thing the forecasting community can do is I'm saying I'm arguing here that it doesn't make sense to evaluate one point forecast with different point forecast error measures. And every time I get is something for review, I and this happens, they get they give out one forecast and they're evaluating that with the mean squared error and the MAPE and saying, well, method A performs better on MSE and method B performs better on MAPE. I call them out on that and say, look, it doesn't make sense to have one point forecast evaluated by different criteria. Calculate different point forecast, one for each method and one for each uh, accuracy measure. And I think that's going to take some while to percolate uh, through people. What you could do as a consultant? Well, uh, being a consultant is a hard business because uh, you're dependent on the goodwill of people. And um, on the one hand, you're being paid for your expertise. On the other hand, if your expertise uh, requires you to say sorry, but you don't know what you're doing. Uh, that's not a good position to be in. Yeah, um, I'm not saying that you should uh, refuse to work with people who do not have a deep statistical understanding. I'm saying uh, it's good to work on the margin. If they want a good MAPE, then not and adapt your forecasts to have better MAPEs than the expectation forecasts. And if somewhere around the water cooler, you have the time to talk to them about this, then just give out some information and hope something sticks. And it's it's a slow process, and I'm not thinking that uh, will change the world all at once. Mm -hmm. OK, we have a slightly difficult question, to be honest, not directly related to our uh, topic using the quantile loss is great, but it has been at times used to create prediction intervals and the coverage of intervals uh, is uh, sometimes bad. Well, if I rephrase it slightly differently, so we want to use, let's say, pinball loss function to uh, assess the quantiles, but at the same time we have such thing as coverage. How do they uh, connect with each other? Yeah. Um... Good question. So in, in principle, uh, well, you can show that uh, these loss functions are optimized by the correct quantile forecast. So if you're looking at a one sided interval, essentially, so that is only defined by an upper or a lower endpoint or something, these should give in principle a 95% coverage. So there shouldn't really be a conflict here. If you're really, if you're talking about interval forecasts, then there's other loss functions that we haven't touched upon here, and that, uh, as I said, is something for the different uh, for a different talk. I really, am, honestly, am, at least in my line of business, I've rarely really needed interval forecasts as such because, as a retailer, I rarely worry about the lower five percent. I always worry about the upper ninety-five percent, about the upper five percent a tail, not the lower 5% tail, because I always worry more about having enough stock on hand. It may be that for other use cases like electricity or um, uh, call center forecasting, you're, you really want a larger interval, so actually also are interested in the lower endpoint, and then you can use an interval loss that essentially takes losses like these and also adds a factor for the length of the interval. And then you can also think about yeah, other possibilities. You, perhaps you don't really want an, a, an interval going from 5% to 95%, giving you 90% coverage. Perhaps you're really interested in the shortest 90% quanta uh, interval or an, an, asymm an asymmetric 
95% interval, a 90% interval, like one going from 8% to 98%. There is a wonderful preprint by Bremer and Gneiting, uh, just appeared last year on the archive. So if whoever is interested in, in, in that, just uh, ping me and I'll, I'll point you to that, where they go into interval forecasts and how to evaluate them. And that's actually a very, very nice paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, well, I remember if there are some questions left, we can always uh, ask Stefan to answer them on LinkedIn. So uh, follow us on LinkedIn. We will publish those that we don't have time to answer. There is interesting one. Uh, should the target of forecasting be to only win some competition or meeting some debatable industry benchmarks as against targeting the accuracy serving the purpose of wider supply chain business processes so a lot of things in one question i think well, that's a beautiful answer because it really puts the uh, it's a beautiful question because it really puts the answer into my mouth <laughs> so, okay so well as long as you're if you're a, a if you're a student or if you're a, a researcher then of course you're uh, your your uh, purpose or your goal must be to win forecasting competitions because uh, well that that one guy who won the m5 competition he can put that on his cv and that's a beautiful conversation opener and so yes and later on um, for me well of course i still have to win forecasting competitions in terms of when a new customer comes along he you will evaluate us based on our forecasting accuracy, because that's essentially a proxy or a shorthand to seeing whether we know our stuff. But actually, we add value not through better forecasts, but through better stock positions. So as such, I would say forecasting accuracy is nice, and it's uh, it's essentially a signal that we try to, to give out. So, so people see that we're good at what we're doing, but we add value in terms of improving the supply chain and uh, fomenting better business decisions. So that's uh, forecasting is not an, an, an end to it in itself. It's only a tool towards getting well nicely stocked shells and not throwing stuff away. I've just realized that you have just answered the question in the title of your presentation, principal aspiration of false <laughs> advertising. <laughs> Robert, you seem to have a, a final comment and let's close after that. Well, yes, it, it's a, a, a mean comment, really, to Stefan. But, you know, you work for SAP. Uh, my experience of software products in general is they're extremely poor at presenting almost el any element of what you've talked about. Uh, I mean, there are additional features. You added lead time as well as the stock positions and so on. Um, actually getting hold of the forecasts so you can analyze them off stream is difficult. Uh, one of the other questions is about error measures across time, which in my experience are of, uh, as I've said in the uh, note of the M5 competition, but earlier in the, an early paper in 92, we showed the variability of performance across time. These, are, these need to be embedded in commercial software packages, not the whole range of things I've mentioned, but at least some uh, parts of it, in particular, the ability to accumulate uh, the evidence and uh, develop your own measures through some sort of uh, uh, benchmarking and so on. So I think it's really up to people like yourself, Stefan, to actually improve this. So you, you've done the intellectual work as a researcher. Now let's do the uh, practical work as a for SAP and others. Uh, that's a wonderful point that you're making. The problem is that SAP <laughs> and other software companies are big places and the scientists are not the people running the business. We have product owners who make the who call the shots on what's going to be implemented and what's not going to be implemented. And as long as there is not, a, not enough customers clamoring for the kind of things that you're asking for, it's not going to happen because customers want other things. It's back to the uh, earlier question about the clients. The clients yeah. don't know the importance of using appropriate measures and therefore there's no demand for them and, the, and then there's no supply to give exactly. them the abilities to do it. That's right. Which is why we are doing the thankless job of educating future forecasters of the world.
Well, uh, fr from some of the questions, I think we've got a pretty educated audience here. I'm not sure yeah. we're talking to the right people. Yeah, that's the other problem, yeah. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thanks uh, a lot, Robert. Uh, Great presentation, good questions. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, next webinar will be on 16th of April. So follow us on LinkedIn and uh, other places to to well to be, be in touch and understand when the next events happen. Thank you very much everyone and see you. Have a Thanks. Thanks Stefan. Thanks everyone. Thank Have you. Have a nice Easter. Bye bye. Have a great day. Bye.